the story I'm about to share with you is 100% true. I recorded this story back in the fall of 2016, but was a little bit hesitant about sharing it. You'll have to forgive my voice in the video as I was recovering from a bad sinus infection, but I do hope you enjoy. I am a fire watcher. Upon moving into my station, I found the following pages typed on my desk. I am not the author of the following. I am transcribing exactly what I found. Dated 1989. I've been located here for 185 days, according to my calendar. I'm stationed up in the northwest of the United States with two other guys, Clark and Thomas. 185 days. That's five days longer than our stint here should have been. Normally, they rotate us every 180 days. We were supposed to be picked up by a helicopter five days ago. I started writing in this long book, journal, or whatever, because we're overdue for evac, or so we think. Maybe we messed up on the calendar somehow. Our main radio stopped working on day 179. Get up, there's smoke! Leery-eyed, I saw Clark standing over my bunk. I could see the orange slits of light reflecting on his torso, signaling to me it was early morning. Teddy, smoke! Smoke? Huh? I said, still half delirious. Yes, smoke. A really small stream of it, maybe a mile southeast. His eyes were wide and brighter than the sunlight on his uniform. I pulled myself out of the bottom bunk and headed towards the window. I didn't even need my binoculars to see the small silver of smoke creating a shadow in the early sunlight. In 185 days, it's only the second time we've seen a potential fire. For those who don't know what a fire watchtower looks like, it's basically a wooden cabin elevated 100 feet in the air. Ours has a staircase that wraps around the structure beneath the cabin. I'm pretty sure other towers use ladders, but that's besides the point. Clark and I bunk up in the watchtower. We have a little kitchen, our bunk bed, and a 360 degree view of nothing but woods. Thomas sleeps in a tiny cabin at the base of our tower, which is also where our main office is. Office may be too loose of a term. It's one desk and a typewriter, used for typing out reports of what we see out here. I rubbed my eyes and looked over to Clark. Alright, let's go check it out. No way, Teddy. No way, he replied immediately. Clark has been afraid to go past the outhouse since day 180 passed. He's afraid a helicopter will come, and he'll miss his chance to be rescued. Rescued, Clark would say. But are we in danger? Did we miscalculate the number of days we've been out here? We still have plenty of food. Did they forget about us? Has the apocalypse come and gone? and we don't know because we've been isolated? Okay, fine, I agreed. Radio down to Thomas and let him know. He should be up. Our main radio back to base isn't getting a sign of life from anywhere. And if it isn't receiving from anywhere, we assume we aren't being heard from anywhere. Luckily, we still have our own walkie-talkies to communicate with each other. Clark took out his walkie-talkie. Tom, there's some smoke about a mile southeast. Can you go check it out? A few seconds passed before Thomas responded. After I finish wiping my ass, I'll be on my way. Unless you want to help me with that, Clarky. Thomas, the oldest of us, is always picking on Clark, the youngest. He doesn't really dislike Clark, he's just easy to pick on. He's a 23 year old college dropout. I think he studied accounting, or finance or something, on his parents dime. I don't think he left college to be a professional fire watcher. No. I think he left to come out in the wilderness, to be alone, and to take a retrospective look at his life, to decide what he really wants. You only sign up for 180 days of isolation if you're crazy, or if you want to get away from something. I'm not sure which category Thomas falls in. He's a cryptic, brute of a man. His picture is probably in the dictionary next to Lumberjack. He's pretty quiet unless he has a joke to tell or something important to say. Either way, when he opens his mouth, I listen. 
As for me, well, it's not important why I'm out here. Headed out now, Thomas radioed. Clark and I watched Thomas start his trek into the tree line until we can no longer see him. Clark cocked his head towards mine. Teddy, he said to me, Thomas has been acting different, weird. I didn't expect him to be so blunt, but I noticed. I knew Clark had noticed, but this was the first time we spoke about it. I know. He doesn't seem to be bothered that we're stuck out here. We don't know if we are stuck out here. We have could have scratched the dates wrong. You know, we thought we didn't scratch the day off yet, but we really did. So we actually only scratched the next day too. I guess, Clark said softly. I knew what he was going to say next. At night though, shouted Clark. Come on Teddy, it's fucked up. He's fine during the day and then just, just changes. Does he have some type of illness? It happened so sudden. Maybe he does. So what if the guy goes out at night to stare at trees? Trees? Stare at trees? I know you've seen it. He goes near the tree line and stands there for a while, looking out, sometimes hours. Maybe he does have a screw loose, and maybe he shouldn't be out here. But I don't think it's the best idea to bring it up to him when we're trapped out here with him, especially if he's insane. Silence fell between us before Clark responded. I didn't know he stares out at the forest, he said to me in a soft voice, and his eyes were wider than when he woke me up this morning. Oh, wait what? What were you going to say? At, at, at night, he stammered. He, he comes up the stairs. I looked over to our half-open door, leading out to the staircase, letting a cool breeze in. What, what do you, what? He comes up the stairs and just, just looks at us, stares at us. Thomas left to go check out a smoke about an hour ago. It seems to have vanished, so I figured he handled it. Clark spends his days using our walkie-talkies, trying every station possible to lure anyone nearby. I just watch the forest. It's 11.30pm. Thomas isn't back. He left at about 7am. He hasn't answered his radio. Tomorrow will be day 186. We don't know if Thomas is okay, and one of us will most likely have to check the woods tomorrow, and since Clark is chicken shit, it'll end up being me. More disturbing though, is something Clark told me a few minutes ago, the reason I went back to the office to type this. I was leaned back in my chair, spinning slowly, making sure there were no lights or fires in the dark expanse of the trees, and wondering where Thomas was. He must have been hurt. Even if he was lost, he would reply on his walkie. We always answer our walkies. They are with us at all times, even when we are shitting or showering. Clark stopped my chair mid-spin and mid-thought. Before I could protest, he spoke. Listen, I need to tell you something I've been thinking about recently. It's eating away at me. I wondered if it had to do with Thomas. Alright, I said. I'm all yours. It's going to sound crazy, he warned. I've bet I heard crazier. He took a long, yet stuttered inhale, then spoke. I, I don't remember coming out here. My facial expression didn't change, and it looked like he was waiting for a reaction, so he repeated. I don't remember coming out here. Do you? Do you remember applying for this job? Do you remember being interviewed or being flown out here? At first, I was almost amused. Then, as he asked those questions, I froze. I didn't remember. He continued. You know how I said I decided to leave college? Well, now I'm thinking about it harder. I don't know if I did. I mean, I must have, right? To be out here? I must have. But all I can remember is my last day of class for the semester. And then I was here. I don't remember anything between coming home after class and meeting you and Thomas. I was listening, but it probably didn't show. I was still motionless. I couldn't remember. I tried and am still trying. Thomas is missing. Clark and I are losing our minds or, or something else. 
Either way, I can't explain it yet. There are more pages scattered about, but I haven't figured out the order. Some are ripped and some are faded, beyond recognition. But there is a more pressing, an imminent problem at hand. About 30 minutes ago, I met Gary and Harold. We've been stationed out here for the next 180 days. I don't know whether to tell them what I found. And I don't remember whether to tell them that I don't remember coming here. Did you honestly think that this was a real video? Did you? You either A, don't own a calendar and have no idea what day it is, or B, need to learn how to read video descriptions. Either way, I hope you enjoyed and I hope you subscribe to Spades of Death. And now for some random dancing. <laughs>